Tucker to, to host this event. Um, typically, these events, these Highlander welcomes would be at a, an establishment, a restaurant, typically to, to welcome our recent graduates to the Highlander family, the alumni family. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, that is not the case. And so um, we've asked our, our regional networks to um, come up with a topic that they would like to, to host a, a panel of alumni on. And so the Orange County chapter um, really wanted to, to look at social media and the ways that our alumni are using their social media to brand themselves and to um, really create that personal brand. And so I'm really excited to be able to have worked with the Orange County chapter on this event and to be able to have a pretty great alumni panel joining us today. The one nice thing about these new versions of Highlander Welcomes is that typically in the past they are very regional based and alumni based, but we've been able to reach alumni all over, not just in Orange County, and expand to current students and to faculty. We have a pretty good chunk of students on here today. And so welcome to everyone joining us, whether you're an alumni, a student, if you're in the Orange County um, area or not, I'm really excited to be able to provide this um, great opportunity for you all. Um, these events are made possible through the Alumni Association if you are a current alumni and aren't a member of the Alumni Association, we really encourage you to, to take advantage of that membership and all the, the nice perks that come with that. If you are a current student, um, just a little plug for when you do graduate to um, make sure that you uh, stay connected with UCR um, through the Alumni Association. Through the Alumni Association, we have alumni networks. We have some special interest networks that are identity-based, but we also have our regional networks, kind of like I was talking about, that are going to be more regionally based, mostly throughout California. Our Orange County chapter that is, is working with this event specifically um, has some of their, their board members on the call today. And so I'd like to actually um, invite on of the Orange County chapter, the president, to um, give a quick welcome. Hey everyone. Um, on behalf of the Orange County chapter, I'd like to thank you and welcome you to the event. Um, when we first uh, uh, thought of this event, um, this was at the start of the stay at home order. And so uh, we saw a lot of people start up uh, a side hustle, turn their side hustle into their main hustle. And really, as we stayed at home, uh, we, we looked at kind of how we could interact with people really the same way. Um, and we saw social media really uh, accelerate from being a way to kind of supplement your day to day life uh, to really how we ground a lot of our life now. Um, and so whether it's getting the word out on your passion project or establishing your online presence and building your brand, uh, we think this is the way. Uh, so we've got a great group of folks uh, on here tonight to share their expertise with you. Um, and also, if you've got some energy, I'm also inviting you to stay connected with your Highlander family. Um, we're always looking for some new board members to help our chapter, plan events, and stay involved. Uh, so please feel free to uh, reach out to us on social media or uh, just reply to Rachel's email and uh, we'll connect. Um, so lastly, uh, whether you've already graduated or are still a student, um, I encourage everyone to continue your learning journey. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks for all that you do for the Orange County chapter. We are really excited and happy to have you part of our, of our team. A couple housekeeping things before we get started. Um, we will be recording this session, and so if you miss anything or um, you know, want to be able to share it with someone else, um, you can absolutely uh, send that over to, to those folks. We'll send it out in an email after the fact, and so um, keep an eye out for a follow-up email that will include the recording of the session. Similarly, we have some predetermined questions and the questions that you all submitted um, in your registration. So thanks to everyone that submitted those. Um, but beyond those, if you do have a question that comes up throughout the session, we really encourage you to submit those. Um, you can submit those through the chat feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen, if you're not familiar with Zoom. Just submit those and we'll try and get to as many as we can. And um, we had quite a few already submitted. So again, thanks for, for those and we'll work to get through those as, as much as possible. At this time, I'd like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so our panelists would like to tell us their name, what year they graduated UCR, what they're doing now professionally, and your kind of connection to, to social media, whether it's professionally in, in your work that you do or um, outside of that. And so we can go ahead and, and Taylor, if you'd like to kick us off and, and introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Taylor Pollard. I graduated from UCR in 2016, and I majored in art studio. Currently, professionally, I am a talent manager, and I also create content for brands such as Nike, Walmart, Old Navy, um, for social media. Great. Thanks, Taylor. Noelle, would you like to go next and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Noelle Esparrow. I graduated from UCR back in 2014. 
I studied neuroscience, so definitely very different from what I'm doing now. But uh, my experience in social media started just a little over a year ago. Um, I was originally working in sales and wanted to do something more in the marketing and media space. And my first role was at BuzzFeed as a, an account executive. And right now I work over on the Snapchat team as, a, as an account strategist, which is basically half sales and half uh, account management. Cool, thanks Noel. Ronnie, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Robbie Witt. I'm a 2015 uh, baseball alum of UC Riverside and, um, you know, really took uh, an economics degree, which really doesn't have anything to do with marketing and uh, parlayed that into a couple of marketing jobs in the financial services industry at Bank of California and Pacific Life Insurance. And then now um, what did start as a side hustle has now become a full-time job. Uh, me and my wife run a clothing bo boutique online uh, called Exo Mandy Sue. And so we do all of the social media and content creation for that. Very cool. Thanks, Robbie. And our last panelist, Neil, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Excited to be here. My name is Neil Goyle. I'm a recent graduate, graduated in June 2020 with a bachelor's in computer science. Um, I currently work professionally as a technical product manager at PayPal. Uh, so my day to day looks like um, if you look, if, if you ever think of whenever you make a transaction on a terminal at any store, what happens behind the scenes, that's usually what I do. And I also work on this cool new a cool product we have, the Venmo Venmo card. So if you haven't heard of it, suggest you go ahead and grab one. Um, yeah, and via social media, I am a content creator on LinkedIn. I started about a couple of years ago and um, I typically post about content related towards students. So I started out with just posting uh, videos with uh, distinguished students at UCR and then now I've expanded to sharing my journey as a product manager and some mistakes I made in college and so on and so forth. And yeah, excited to share my story and uh, some advice on social media. Oh, thanks, Neil. And I actually have one of those Venmo cards. So really cool that you work with those. It's nice to know that you're one of the people working behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, cool. We'll go ahead and dive into some of the questions that, that we have for our panelists. Again, um, submit your questions anytime throughout the throughout the session to um, get those answered by any of our any of our panelists. Um, so we've talked a lot already, kind of about you know that the idea of a personal brand and and branding yourself. And so. Um, just to kind of start off the conversation, we'd love to hear our panelists' thoughts on, you know, how would you describe what a personal brand is and kind of what all goes into that? Taylor, would you like to, to get us started again? Yes. Okay, I would define a personal brand as, especially on social media, as how you would highlight yourself or how you want to market yourself to whatever your audience is. So, like, for me personally, well, since I am a manager, I help my clients build their own brand. Uh, one of my clients is my little sister. Um, she's 13 years old, but I helped build her brand from, she's 13, but she has 250,000 followers on Instagram. And because her brand is really um, encouraging others to love who you are and, you know, just being a self-inspiring person. Um, and so when we create content for her, you know, it was, surrounded around um, inspiring messages. So like whatever your personal brand is or what you're trying to convey to your audience, um, the content that you post should reflect that. Thanks, Taylor. And you want to give us a little bit more kind of the background behind, I see you're wearing the, the flex in and the yes. shirt, so maybe give us a little bit more of the background behind that story. Yeah, so me and my little sister, who's 13, like I said, we created a brand called Flexing My Complexion, and we started that um, about three years ago now because she was being bullied in school for being dark-skinned. She went to a predominantly white school, and she was, like, one of only four other Black kids in the classroom. Um, and so from that, she um, started a platform on social media you know, really a anti-bullying campaign and, you know, just letting people know just to love yourself. And it's okay to be different because no two people are the same anyway. So you shouldn't make anyone feel bad for being different from who you are. And so we created a brand called Flexing My Complexion and we sell clothing and t-shirts, hoodies and stuff that has the saying. Um, and from doing this and by using social media, we've been able to connect with celebrities like Lupita Nyong'o. We actually did a t-shirt collaboration with her and um, LeBron James and 
big people like that. <laughs> Really cool. I think that's such a really cool meaning behind the, the whole story there. And um, what, a, what a great sister you are. So uh, thank you. <laughs> thanks for sharing that. I think that's, that's really cool and a really great story. Thank you. Absolutely. Neil, would you like to share us maybe a bit about kind of your experience in, you know, personal branding, especially I know you're pretty big in the, in the LinkedIn world. And so kind of what that, what that means to you. Sure. Well, I appreciate the compliment. Um, how I look at personal branding is I think it's the, I, I actually look at it as the opposite of what the, the audience says about you. So, um, and the reason why I say this is um, as a content creator, we have our vision as our, our story of what we're trying to communicate to the public um, on what we're uh, on our different messages or our, our different content. Uh, but it's actually up to the audience to sit into on what they get and what they talk about you uh, behind closed doors. And I think one small instance that I had, was actually, uh, so when I, I mentioned earlier, I started my content journey as uh, posting this mini video series where I would interview distinguished students at UCR about popular Gen Z and millennial topics related to job search. So that's how I described what I did. Uh, but um, it was interesting, a, a friend of mine was describing my video series to another person like, oh yeah, you should check out Neil's video series. Uh, yeah, he just posts videos with his friends. Uh, it's super cool, they're, they're a bunch of engineers. And I was like, kind of it but not really now i was like i was like i really I, what i took from that was i was like there, um you know um, my uh your role your role in personal branding is so uh, so much so as what you what you what messages that you're trying to communicate and how you kind of communicate that with your audience and what value are you bringing them so i think now as i kind of have gone through this two-year journey i recently saw a message from a student and right now i'm trying to share my journey as a product manager and he messaged me saying, oh yeah, I, uh, another product manager referred me to you because, yeah, because of all your content on product management. So I was like, oh, fantastic. So that way my personal brand is being heard. And, as, and uh, in the LinkedIn space, since I started this out as a student, if any student is watching this, um, social media is such a powerful tool for you to use in job search since the industry become, has become so competitive. So now that as you, I highly encourage you to make content on LinkedIn or any other platform as well and start to uh, talk about the job that you're interested in. If it's product marketing, product management, sales, whatever it may be, um, start talking about that. And then soon enough, um, those recruiters or those uh, different hiring managers are going to be talking about you behind closed doors and talking about your personal brand and maybe be interested in hiring you. Yeah, thanks, Neil. I think you pull up some really great points too. Of there's only... There's so much we can do to convey that, but it's also how others will interpret it. And so you have to really do your best to, to do that. So I think that made some really great points. Noelle, would you like to share with us a bit about maybe your thoughts on personal branding, especially maybe having a different journey um, and coming from maybe like the neuroscience background and kind of being able to still spin that in, into your personal brand? Yeah, absolutely. So with the roles that I have right now, um, I majority of my career has been through sales and a lot of the platforms that you use in order to get those kind of jobs is mostly through LinkedIn. Um, and that's how the, that's how I got into social media and into a completely different industry than I, than I started with even at UCR. Um, and in order to use that, the power of LinkedIn is really incredible because you are able to connect with people that you went to school with or may have cross paths with at, at some point in your life. Um, and that's really how I got to where I am today and um, kind of breaking down that door of my first, I think it was like my, I wanna say my, actually my third interview at a media agency. And one of the people who was interviewing me, he, um, he actually put me in touch with someone that worked at BuzzFeed and I was able to get that job um, and, and able to get that interview from someone that went to UCR. So the power of really utilizing your connections is so important, especially for someone like me who was in a completely different, um, in a completely different industry than what I'm doing now. It's, it's incredibly important. So uh, I think it's, in terms of personal branding, in terms of personal branding on the other side, when you're looking at other platforms, if say, for example, I was someone like an influencer or wanting to start my own brand, I would even take advantage of the other social media platforms that are out there and really place my, put myself in front of as many people as I can to build that audience. Um, I would use Facebook, I would use Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, the, the opportunities are, are limitless out there, 
But for my personal experience, I think LinkedIn has really gotten me to, to where I am. Thanks for sharing. And I think that's really reassuring for folks, you know, while my instruments on the call, um, being able to hear that you were able to make those networks and even through UCR and UCR folks that you were able to kind of get to where you are now. So thanks for sharing and glad that you were able to make those connections. Absolutely. Robbie, would you like to share with us a bit, especially, you know, looking at, you know, in two different roles, we're looking at it through the organizational role, but then also the, the boutique that you and your, your wife um, have and kind of how you see personal branding there. Yeah, I think um, big fan of personal branding and making sure that what the content that you put out is something that you're proud of. And, and there's two big reasons, I think. I think the first one everybody touched on is big. This can lead to connections and it can get you a job. It can it help build your career. But I think maybe even more importantly, um, and it's hard to know this in the moment, but sometimes they'll go, you know, an employer goes and researches you online and sees your Instagram and, and sees your whatever you got out there. And they don't hire you because of something you may have on there, a political view, whatever it may be. But I'll tell you, sometimes that's the biggest blessing because it's better to be told you're not going to get this job, you know, for whatever reason, than it would be to go work for somebody who wouldn't have wanted to be a good fit with you anyway. So when you put out who you really are on these social media platforms, number one, you're going to attract people like you and, and who are like-minded and it'll be a great fit for you. And in another sense, you kind of put up this guard against bad fits and bad outcomes where, you know, I know it may hurt in the moment um, to get a, a letter of rejection or whatever in the mail, but that's much better uh, than being at a job you don't like for a year or two years. Um, so I think it's just a, a, a very different way to play it is to look at who you're attracting and who you're keeping a guard up against with your personal brand. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Robbie. And that actually I think goes kind of well into our next question of, um, you know, how do you balance your personal and your professional images on, on social media? You know, you so far in, in life, I feel like we've always thought, you know, LinkedIn is the professional media, but Instagram, we can share all of our best photos or whatnot, but I feel like that that line is getting a little bit more blended nowadays. And so I was wondering, you know, everyone's thoughts on how do you really kind of make that balance between a professional and a personal image? And really, is there a difference anymore? Do they all kind of go together into what your own general personal brand is professionally and personally? Um, Noelle, do you have um, thoughts right off the, right off the bat? Yeah, um, I think it kind of just goes back to the idea of who your personal brand is and you really sticking true to who you are. Um, in my, in my opinion, I think social media is really your elevator pitch and how you're expressing your thoughts and your ideas. And that can be communicated through, through images, through the content that you put out, through blogs, through images, videos, all of that. So um, personally, I think whatever you're putting out, be proud of it and really showcase who you are. Great. Thanks, Noelle. Taylor, I'd love to hear from you and especially, you know, working with, with your sister and some of the, the different folks you've worked with, probably not on LinkedIn, but really as well. <laughs> so I wanted to hear kind of your thoughts on the other side of, you know, these other platforms. Yeah, definitely not LinkedIn, but for sure, like Instagram, <laughs> I can speak more to. Um, what I can honestly say is for social media, if you're being like 100% authentic to who you are with your personal brand, your personal images and your business in images will kind of be similar. For instance, like if you're into fitness and you know, so you post a lot of fitness, like maybe videos and tutorials and what you eat, you know, that's something that you already do on a day to day. Like, you know, your personal images and your business related images, um, like what will be um, sponsored by brands and et cetera, will kind of be like the same um, thing. Um, so yeah, just kind of depending on what your personal brand is, it can definitely like relate and, you know, it won't be really any different. Great. Thanks, Taylor. Robbie, you were kind of starting to get at it when we were talking before, so I'd love to hear some more of your thoughts on kind of I, I think Taylor hit that right on the head because, you know, as you mentioned, the line's really blurred. Whereas if you're talking to people, you know, 10, 15 years ago on Facebook, you know, you're talking about people who were very guarded and privatizing their, their profiles, making sure an employer wasn't gonna see them. But now today, I mean, you look at Taylor's example, let's say you, you are into fitness, right? 
and you love because you're an ex-athlete or whatever you you love going to the gym and you're posted in your angels jersey or your lakers jersey or whatever and all of a sudden now this guy who's who's looking to hire you goes onto your profile and all of a sudden he sees that he's got a bunch of similar interests as you um, that line really gets blurred whereas you thought you were posting something really personal right you're going to the gym working out this is your thing this is what you do you know this is how you have fun and all of a sudden that's going to help get you a job because now you get that interview you got the foot in the door and you've already got something to dialogue with besides the resume because there's a lot of people with resumes out there who are really good but it's about having a personal relationship and connection with somebody outside of that that can give you a leg up that that makes total sense and definitely something that you don't always think about when you're making those posts, but at the end of the day, it could really come back to, to help you in the long run. Neil, I'd love to, you know, hear your thoughts, especially coming from someone who might work more on the LinkedIn side. And so thinking of kind of the way that that may fall into some of the other platforms. Sure. Um, so I think that uh, how, I'm going to take a little different spin on this question. Um, one thing that I see often with students is that they're concerned that they have to set a certain image and they have to portray a certain thing because that's exactly what they see that a job employer or a recruiter is looking for. They need this certain, they, they need this perfect resume. They need this perfect like X, Y, Z skills. They can't be themselves. And I think everyone on this panel touched on that being yourself and being genuine and authentic is the, the key to do it. And I think that one thing that's also very valuable, and I think that uh, you know, some people miss the mark is that in social media, you have to kind of uh, show the highlights of what you do. You have to show the accomplishments, the, the successes of what you do. But honestly, the kind of the journey of how you got there, the mistakes, the uh, things that were in progress, maybe some things you're like, oh, I wish I did this, are also super valuable. And that shows a lot of growth because I think that uh, kind of showing your journey makes it, it makes me as an audience member not only uh recognize that hey you're a person but you and that you also make mistakes but also makes me want to root for you more when you do get that accomplishment so i think that uh, when you kind of find that personal versus professional balance it's good to post both because again you're trying to be that authentic genuine person and it doesn't matter whether it's on linkedin on instagram on youtube you should always be and be that same person throughout yeah, Neil, I, I love that advice. I think that's really great for, for everyone on the call, call to hear because I think so much of the time we do think of, you know, what, what's going to give me that job? What do folks want to see? But knowing that being true to yourself and being proud of everything you're posting, regardless of kind of if it's only in that positive light, is really important. So I appreciate you, you touching on that. Sure. Kind of so one of the things that Robbie also started kind of touching on is, you know, sometimes we hear it a lot in, in the media, even today, of, of folks having things that may come up on their social media from the past or whatnot, or a post that they make that may, you know, may not get them a job or may get them potentially fired or whatnot. And so I'd love to hear um, everyone's thoughts on the best way to handle a situation um, where there's controversy over a post you made, um, whether recently or in the past. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of what maybe the best route to go is if, if something like this were to come up. Um, Robbie, do you wanna kind of take us on this one first since you kind of started talking about it earlier a bit? Absolutely, and I think, man for all of us um you know especially if you go to ucr or, or any real good university like this you're gonna have views that you had in high school that you know by the time you're 30 you're gonna look back and you're gonna think i was crazy what was i thinking and you know in, in the day and age we're in you know if you're 16 you have a social media and you're probably posting things like that the, the thing I really recommend, if somebody does dig something up like that, um, what you wanna do is continue to post your views so that they'll be able to see, as Neil touched on, a, a string of growth. So yes, here's this insane view that I may have had when I was 16, but I could pull posts from age 20 to 24 to 28 and show you an evolution of a person, which shows you one thing, that they're not just stubborn and holding on to their views no matter what, and number two, that they have the ability to grow and understand and learn, which is half the battle in a lot of these scenarios. Um, you know, as we all know, you get a job, you don't know everything one in day, on day one. This can kind of help, you know, pivot you to be able to show, hey, I can prove, I can learn, I can adapt. And so it's, it's about kind of taking that negative, owning it, and then showing how you can grow through it. Great. Thanks, Javi. I think that's, that's really great advice for, for folks. Taylor, do you have um, thoughts, especially, you know, having 
250,000 followers for your sister, you know, sometimes it probably can be pressuring of wanting to, knowing that not everyone may always agree with what you're posting. Yeah, no, actually, and I do have an example um, that I can give you guys. Um, so my sister with her clothing brand, Flex My Complexion, I don't know if you know who um, James Charles is, um, but this was about like a year ago. Um, my sister, she had gave him a shirt, a Flex My Complexion shirt, he took a picture, he, um, they posted it on Instagram, and my sister reposted on her page, um, and uh, literally all hell broke loose <laughs> on Instagram because everyone was upset that he was wearing a shirt, you know, because I guess he's made, like, racist remarks um, maybe in the past, but, you know, in that moment, he was saying, like, you know, I'm supporting this young girl and what she's doing, but um, a lot of people felt almost disrespected by my sister posting him wearing it um so really i when it comes to social media and controversial posts i have like a seven a 72 hour rule um where it's like you know don't say anything for 72 hours and if it blows over then it kind of blows over um in that instant though we turned off the comments so you know it wouldn't keep going um but yeah i and I also agree with what you said too, Robbie, about like, you know, take the experience, own it, and, you know, learn from it and grow. Um, I think it was really more so a learning experience for James Charles than it was for us. Um, but yeah, like, you know, just own those experiences and keep growing. Thanks so much, Taylor. And I mean, still a cool experience to be able to work with James Charles, but still also I think it's a great. <laughs> Great, great example to, to share and something I think that, you know, you, we're seeing more and more of, and so I appreciate your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Noelle, do you want to, do you have thoughts on, on this topic? Yeah, so the one time that I've had something happen to me that was somewhat controversial, uh, someone at my old job had followed me on Instagram and saw that I posted like a, a picture of me at the beach, um, and they weren't super thrilled about it the company that I was working at, at the time was a little bit more um, conservative and going through that, going through that conversation wasn't very easy, but also it was coming from a place of me being who I am. And this is me in real life. It wasn't any, it was just me in a, in a bathing suit. Um, so I, I think on their end too, they also need to think about the position that they may not agree with everything that you may post. And that's okay, but it's also coming from a place that maybe they're just kind of trying to protect their values and maybe that may not align with you at the time. But I think at the end of the day, it all just boils down to having that common ground and understanding that not everyone is gonna have the same values that you have um, and kind of just growing just like everyone kind of touched on. Thanks, Noel. And I, I think, yeah, that's a great point that things you may not even think are controversial may be controversial for other folks. And so um, I think at the end of the day, knowing that sometimes that is going to happen as much as you may try for it not to, um, things simply as a, as a bathing, bathing suit post could be, could be <laughs> controversial in some eyes. And so I think that's, that's, that's a good point. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> Neil, do you have thoughts to share as well? Sure. Um, the Controversy is you, you usually normally comes when, as you scale up in social media, no matter no matter what you post about. So, I think that uh, the challenge with uh, so, social media is that as you post content, you're sharing your opinion, and again, like, like the panelists said, not everyone's going to agree. And I think that um, one experience that, that that I had is um, what do you call that? I I posted about you know my my experience in college at UCR, and then I had a student from a foreign country say. And he had a different style of schooling, and he was like, "Oh, well, this is not how you should do it. You should schooling should be this way." Blah blah blah. So um, clearly, there's there's a little bit of, of angst towards my uh, uh, and towards the post. And um, my re my instant reaction was like, "Well, hold on now." But I the next reaction, and I think that this is how I kind of hold true to any situation where there's a little bit of uh, angst towards my post is to kind of have empathy towards the person to try to see from their perspective and see that, okay, you know, um, not everyone has the same opinion. What are, what are they trying to see? Kind of put it in their shoes and what are their experiences? And then with that empathy, then I try to respond in a way that make, makes them feel that they're heard and listened to uh, while also kind of 
and maintaining your perspective as well. So kind of finding that balance in, in the midst of controversy and then, yeah, reflecting and then owning that experience and being like, okay, now, uh, now that I've seen a variety of different perspectives, as I post different messages about this, maybe I, uh, maybe there's a different spin on a different view. I can do it to make sure that it's inclusive towards everyone, so on and so forth. But yeah, that's my take. Great. Thanks, Neil. And thanks to all of you for sharing. I know that can obviously be a harder topic to, top, to talk about, especially when there sometimes really is no right way to, to go about um, dealing with, with controversy in social media. So appreciate you all for sharing your thoughts and your personal experiences in, in regards to that. One of the big things that we're all experiencing, we're all here for a reason, is you know the pandemic that we're, we're all going through. And so I'd love to hear more from you all about how you've seen the pandemic change social media. Um, obviously, we, a lot of us may be on it a lot more than we, we were before and um, seeing our screens a lot more than we may have been in the past. And so um, for those of you that you know, are, are very active on social media or even may work for social media companies, um, how have you kind of seen some of the, the changes that the pandemic has, has brought forth? Noel, I'll throw it to you first as someone who you knows working at Snapchat and working for a, for a social media company. Yeah, absolutely. So. I believe it was back in February or it was in March when the pandemic happened. I remember when I was sitting in my office, it was super rainy here in LA and I'll never forget that day. But it was when that day started that the world kind of came to a standstill and what we did on the, when we all came indoors is everyone starts looking at their phone. Um, for someone that works at a social media platform like I do and especially at Snap, um, it did put us in a place of an advantage where we're gonna see higher user engagement on there. People are gonna wanna come to the social media platforms more for connection and even just looking at consumer behavior. Um, people can't really go into malls anymore, can't buy anything at retail stores. So on the advertising side as well, we're seeing even more of a growth in our revenue because brands are wanting to come on and be in front of a very highly engaged audience who is most likely gonna purchase a product or be able to be exposed to a completely new brand that they may have not heard about before. Um, although this is a really hard time for everyone in terms of social media and how our, how our company personally has been growing is, um, has, has been quite incredible. We've seen user growth and again, that ad revenue just continue to rise even in the midst of um, some hard challenges for everyone. Yeah, no, that's something I didn't even think about of, you know, the, the ads, I can imagine how stores are really relying on those and, and online shopping. I mean, even thinking to my own online shopping, it's definitely increased since, yeah. since COVID. So I think that's, yeah, good, good to know. Exactly. Taylor, do you have thoughts, you know, managing your, your sister and other folks? How have you kind of transitioned to, to doing that during a during pandemic? Yeah, so really when the pandemic hit, it honestly, I can say like for most content creators, it probably was a really scary time um, because when it first hit, a lot of the brands were like, okay, we're putting a pause on influencer programs and, you know, and content. And so, you know, if that's like your main source of income, you're like, oh, well, what am I going to do now? <laughs> what am I going to do now? And um, it was also kind of scary because um, at the time we were working on our Old Navy campaign and the plan was for it to be in stores and, you know, the clothing line that my sister helped design was supposed to be in stores. But it's like, if the stores is closed, what are we supposed to do <laughs> you know um but as the pandemic you know as time went on and people started to adjust to what's going on right now um and starting to implement more social media and you know just online shopping um i mean i'll just say it's just kind of different it's just different also because usually when you do campaigns you'll have like professional photographers and stuff to take pictures for campaigns but now it's like we kind of have to do everything ourselves at home so in my opinion, it's kind of harder <laughs> during the pandemic doing everything because we're doing everything ourselves. Um, but yeah, I would just say it's just different. It's, yeah, it's just a lot more work for content creators, for sure. So you've added lots of extra skills to your resume is what I'm hearing. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, I've been so stressed. While everybody's been chilling at home during this pandemic, I've been stressed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks for, thanks for sharing, Taylor. <laughs> 
Uh, Ravi, I'd love to, to hear from you more and uh, hear kind of how you've um, made that transitioning, especially with your, your boutique even and, and all of that with the... Yeah, as, as Taylor said, um, you know, hiring models, hiring photographers, especially in those initial, you know, moments of the pandemic of everybody going home, that became very difficult as, you know, people became more wary of, you know, who they want to be around, which I totally understand. I totally get it. Um, but then, as Noel perfectly stated, you see people go inside, they run on their phones, and I think a lot of boutiques, a lot of online advertisers catch wind of this, and that's where the ad revenue comes from. People are running there. They know people's eyes are not in the mall. They can't go to the movies. They can't go to the restaurant. They probably just got a $1,200 check. It's burning a hole in their pocket. They gotta go somewhere with it. So that created a little bit, although we're scared in the moment, created some opportunity for online retailers um, that really I think has, has panned out well. And this is not, I mean, I'm very empathetic and I feel very bad for a lot of the restaurants and small businesses um, that have had their doors closed for so long. Um, but this is just a point here of saying, you know, there's opportunity out there because of the amount of eyes that are on a phone right now, because there's, you know, less vacations, people are on their phones. Um, and this is where they're getting information. Thanks, Ravi. Neil, I, you graduated during the pandemic and went and, and got your first job. And so I'd really love to hear, you know, your thoughts on that, but especially even just, you know, what was that job search like in, in that kind of graduating during the, during the pandemic like for you? I can only imagine what, what that was like. Sure. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the first question. And I'll, I'll, I'll pivot towards this. So I think from my perspective on how the pandemic has affected social media, I think it gave it a hyper growth. I think, uh, uh, I think as Noel mentioned in the beginning, everyone's on their phone. So everyone turns to uh, look at social media, but also start to realize that, hey, I want to start maybe sharing my opinion and my voice. I think that um, TikTok had its, probably its, its largest revenue growth during the pandemic, which is which we think is counterintuitive based on how the rest of the economy is doing. So, with that in mind, that uh, that also makes it and, and makes me see as an individual uh, um, or maybe as a brand um, to make your make your social media messages much more succinct as well. Um, as you see, apps like TikTok or Triller um, are are uh, what do you call that? Um, seeing a lot more growth. And th those are social media apps that typically have maybe like what seven to eight seconds of attention span. So that really kind of puts into perspective how short, uh, short, uh, uh, short style content is uh, re really taking into more precedence. Um, in terms of uh, uh, how it's affected, I guess, gra my graduation and kind of the job search industry, I think that uh, unfortunately a lot of uh, students lost their internships or full-time jobs due to the pandemic. Um, and, and that was really unfortunate here. But I think that one thing that, I saw uh, quite a bit it was that a lot of people started to preach their voice on, on LinkedIn saying, um, not preach, but share their voice saying that, hey, I, you know, I lost my job. I'm really interested in um, X, Y, Z. Here's my resume. Um, please feel free to share. And I think that I saw a huge rally of the community just support that, like by commenting, liking. Um, and I just, at that, at that moment, I was like, wow. That really shows that this isn't just a platform, but a community uh, really supporting one another. And I think that that I saw a lot of success stories from my friends who who did that, and they they got op opportunities with uh, recruiters or hiring managers who weren't necessarily working for the big companies, but maybe for the smaller companies, and 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 need to hire maybe an engineer or a product manager, and uh, you know got that through social media. So that so it really kind of shows the, not only the power but the ability to kind of share your voice in the, the messages that it carries, it carries across. So that's kind of the change that I've seen the pandemic do and shows it should really it's true value of social media. That's great to hear, especially, you know, I'm sure a lot of students, your recent graduates on the call may even be, be feeling some, some stress around that. So I think that's, that's good to know that you found that community and seen that in LinkedIn and hopefully others may be able to find that as well. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot of stress that goes with entering the workforce during, during, these, during these challenging times. So. Um, Really happy for you and congrats on graduating, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna start transitioning into some of the questions we received from participants. Um, so again, if you are on the call and have any questions, please submit those and we will work to get to them. But um, going to our questions we already have submitted, um, we'll start with this first one of 
how do you grow your social platform? How do you get more followers? Um, how do you kind of go about doing that in a, in a pretty authentic way? Um, Taylor, I'll start with you, 250,000. I feel like you're a good first person to, to ask about this. How do you, how do you build that base? Um, the advice I would give to someone as far as building your social platform and especially authentically, like if you don't want to pay for, um, you know, you can pay to promote your posts and stuff like that. Authentically, I will say to take advantage of trends. Um, so say what's something that's popular right now? Um, what's a challenge? I can't even think of a challenge right now. Okay, but let's just say if there was like a, a TikTok challenge or a dance challenge or something that was popular, like, you know, you can take that and kind of um, personalize it to whatever your personal brand is, just to make it unique to yourself. And that can get a lot of traction. I will also say it's super important to be consistent in your posting. Um, I've talk personally to like the workers at Instagram and they say that you're supposed to post on your actual feed at least, well, they say like twice, once or twice a day. And I know that's kind of like impossible for a lot of people where it sounds overwhelming. Um, but you know, just so you can stay on people's timeline and um, increase your engagement, because when you increase your engagement, then you pop up more on the discover page, which, you know, is kind of like a, a snowball effect. Um, same thing with like your Instagram stories. They said that your Instagram stories should never be blank, which is, you know, may sound a little bit overwhelming as well. <laughs> but, you know, just um, keeping people engaged with like polls or like asking them questions because the more engaged people are on your Instagram stories, um, the more that your stories pop up on the Discover page and then the more to the front your stories pop up. You know, like when you open your Instagram and you see certain people's stories in the front, those tend to pop up like more in the front of people's um, pages when you have more engagement. So I think that would be my advice. Thanks for your advice. I'll have to go do one of the TikTok trends, apparently, the challenge. Yes. <laughs> I was definitely, as Neil was saying, I was one of those people that downloaded TikTok when the, when the pandemic hit. So I'm, I contributed to, to their growth. <laughs> uh, Neil, do you want to go ahead and, and share your thoughts? Obviously, you've had some great experience with your content being viewed on, on LinkedIn. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of getting that content seen by other folks. Sure. Um, so I think, I think Taylor, uh, addressed it perfectly with hopping on trends and, um, being consistent. I think that one thing that I found, w uh, with, um, I, my, my response is going to be consistency as well. But I think the one thing you want to do is that uh, you, there's a, there's, there's a line between being consistent and sharing the post, but also becoming off as spammy, um, and posting the same things over and over again to the point where people are like, you know, I'm not gonna really going to like it, or I'm just going to view it. And then, uh, the, Instagram or LinkedIn algorithm will say, okay, well, this person is no longer interested and will, it won't pop up in their discovery or the top of their timeline uh, anymore. So making sure that you always put in the uh, in your framework that how is this going to provide value for my audience um, and every single post that you do um, is super important. And I think that really resonates with your, uh, uh, with your audience as well when it comes to uh, being authentic and genuine. Um, I think another thing that you can do is uh, one thing that uh, is a buzzword is uh, uh, cross-platform engagement. So, how do you get your Instagram followers to go to your TikTok followers, or so on and so forth? Like, how do you how do you get how do you get and get across, across those different platforms? And I think one, uh, one one easy strategy as well is that you don't have to recreate the wheel over and over again. So, uh, some things that I do is that I I also um, am starting up my uh, uh, doing you, uh, videos on YouTube as well. And uh, I, a great way to promote it is making a LinkedIn post dedicated to that YouTube, that YouTube video. So for example, if the video is about, you know, how to break into product management, I'll talk about maybe on LinkedIn, like, Hey, a product manager doing X, Y, and Z learn more on this YouTube video, blah, blah, blah. So that's way that we can get that cross platform engagement and kind of see, get people going across, uh, across borders. So I think that's another way to kind of reshare your content and recycle it as well. Another great way to do it. So that, that's kind of my take. Cool. Thanks for sharing. I think that kind of cross platform, um, sharing that you, you talked about is something that's important and something that I haven't even really thought much about. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. Robbie, do you want to share um, some of your thoughts and, you know, maybe even, you know, how do you get all the following of an online boutique and kind of what? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very, um, you know, I will say going from, you know, if you're out there and you're looking to start something going from zero to 100 is, is, is the hardest part or zero to a thousand is the hardest part. Um, you know, and, and Taylor touched on this, consistency is key. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with this next point is, 
if you're if you're like me and Taylor and you have a product that you sell, one of the big things that that can kind of help you is you know people posting in it, and and famous people like she has is is the best in the world. But even taking you know the average person who takes a really nice photo and then you repost them in your story or on your post, and then their friends are all psyched about it, and you get a little bit of an army going if you're reposting. And that's one of our our kind of trademarks is just like Taylor said, it's hard to create content to post once or twice a day. But if you've got this, you know, small little tribe of people who are out there taking really good shots of your clothes at the beach or in the mountains or wherever, and then you're kind of reposting them, not only do they love that because they're on a page with, I don't have 250,000 followers. I'm just 35K. I'm not Taylor. She's the best on here. Okay. But you know, they enjoy that and they like that and it feels good to know that they were recognized. And so it, it, it serves two purposes there of, you know, kind of getting them behind your brand and then elevating them. So it's, it's really, you know, one hand washes the other. And I think it can, it can really help grow your base that way once you've got a, a, a select group that you really like. Great, thanks Robbie, I think that makes total sense. Noelle, do you have any, any thoughts to add? Yeah, honestly, I'm taking notes over here because on the personal <laughs> side for me, um, I don't technically, I'm not in a position where I'm trying to grow a brand for myself, but mm -hmm. kind of taking the little tidbits that everyone was talking about. I think overall consistency is key. Um, I really liked what Robbie kind of touched on and something that I see a lot on the paid side of promoting a business is taking mm -hmm almost testimonial styles of if you do have a brand and someone is posting or has purchased your product and has their posted a, an image or a video of them wearing it, that's almost, especially right now during the pandemic, one of our solutions for driving content and for creating content within the paid space um, within, within ads. So um, something that does really well on Snap what we is something that we like to call UGC style or basically testimonials where um, an example I can give is FabFitFun. We see them all across Instagram, Facebook, and, and Snapchat as well. You'll see a, a woman or someone who is doing like a, a video of them showing the experience of opening the box, showing the audience what kind of products that they have in there. And that's almost free content for your brand. Um, so that's one from my from my side on on the paid side and building uh, building awareness for your brand is not only continually posting uh, content through the the personal through your personal handles, but the paid the paid side helps just as well too. It, it does cost money, but uh, it helps just as good. Yeah. Absolutely. I think yeah, but what you were probably talked about even like the tagging posts. I tagged Neil on LinkedIn and I think my followers jumped a, a bunch just from even tagging all of you on, on LinkedIn and different social media. And so I can definitely see where, where that, that would work. Another question that we've gotten from folks is, um, I lost it. There's no, okay, so there's no interpersonal interaction via social media for the most part. Um, and so what are some of maybe the long-term unfavorable effects of that? And what are some of your proposed solutions to work to make your um, interactions as personal as possible on, on social media? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in first. I'll give you a second to think. Robbie looks like he may have a, a response right away. Yeah, I will say, um, you know, that is true is it's very, you know, distant, right? Who Your best customer could live 2,500 miles away. Um, but there are going to be situations where, and this is true for me and my wife, um, where we had our, our very first model that we come out, the very first model on the website that wasn't my wife was a girl who was a college, uh, she was a college age girl on spring break and she was just down in Newport beach and, um, she was a customer and, um, we invited her out to come model for one of the shoots and, you know, it's kind of weird, right? Like this person you've never met before goes to college 1500 miles away and, you know, just breaking that interpersonal barrier. Um, it's, it's really rewarding one in that now she's really good friend of my wife and she lives on the peninsula and we all hang out now. But um, it just goes to show that, you know, as, as bad as a wrap of social media gets for being very distant and interpersonal, um, I think it does actually create a lot of good. 
um, out in the social world. And I get it, there's bullying, there's terrible things that do happen, but I just wanna share that there is upside, there's a lot of good things that come from this. Thanks for sharing, Ravi, and for the personal example. I think that that's a great example of, of that kind of disconnect. And even today, we could have folks thousands of miles away. And so uh, I think that that's a good point. Neil, Noel, or Taylor, do you have thoughts to add to that? Um, I can add a little bit to that. You know, especially when it comes to social media, um, I believe that engagement is, you know, like the key, especially to building your brand. So, you know, when people comment on your posts, especially if you're selling a product, you may not even know the person, but, you know, you should definitely respond. Um, and then also on Instagram, like the more that you respond to people, then the more that your posts pop up on their feeds or the top of their feeds when you do post something. Um, and also I think, um, well, going back to the previous question that we talked about, like, you know, helping to grow your um, brand even more authentically, I think that collaboration is key. So like you may meet someone on social media that you don't know in real life, but say if they have like 500K followers or something on Instagram, and you guys kind of become friends just from engaging with each other all the time. So then maybe by chance you may go to their city one day and you guys can do like a post or something together, do a TikTok together. And then, you know, if you post it, and then, you know, their followers will be looking at your page now. Cause like, oh, they did something together. Oh my gosh, how do you guys know each other? Like you guys are in two completely different, da, da, da. But yeah, so that's, you know, a good way um, to help build your brand as well too. Perfect, thanks for sharing, Taylor. Neil? Yeah, um, I think that the being as personalized as possible with uh, engaging with your audiences is really key. And I think that the best way to, uh, the best way I found to do it is um, I, this is uh, I look at it as they're taking the time to not only like my post but actually take the time to comment on it. Let me also take the time to make a genuine comment and reply back to them. And it and they also feel really special when you do so when it's not just a generic like for example if I'd make like an accomplishment post and they say like oh congratulations I want instead of just saying a thank you back which I would say to most people I'd be like I maybe look at their profile and be like oh are they doing something cool oh I hope your hope your job and your job is going well so on and so forth so making it very personalized and, and making the audience member feel like, oh, wow, I, uh, I, I really felt like Neil really cared about me, even though it's at scale at, at, at like social media. And I think that that also encourages them to come back and be like, you know, I want to start to engage in more posts and be like, you know, because I, I see that Neil actually cares about my, my little comment, um, you know, out of the many. So, and that can, that, that can apply to large brand, large brands like Taylor's. Um, and, I've even, and I think one, one content creator that I look up to is a guy named Gary B. He has like, what, millions and millions of followers, but I look at him and I, and every, almost every comment I see, he replies back to and he gets tens of, tens of thousands of comments. So that just it tells me that I have no excuse but to, but, but to give replies back to, and, get, and, and create uh, specialized engagement. Yeah, no, I love that. I think, yeah, so many times you are so tempted just to respond with a thanks back. And so I think even those simple personalized responses can easily be uh, pretty impactful. Noelle, do you have, have thoughts to add? Yeah, just just really quick. I think social media was was created for a reason. It's social and it's meaning to create connections, whether that be from brand to brand, whether that be from friend to friend. And a lot of people sometimes abuse the power and, and use it too much to the point where they feel almost even more alone. But I think that kind of goes back to how you're leveraging social media and putting a time limit. If you're on TikTok for six hours, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. But, um, you know, that's more on the consumer side. But um, altogether, I think that the purpose of it is is to establish and continue to, whether it's build a brand or continue to to grow stronger relationships with your friends. It's all for a positive purpose. Um, and if you do feel like it is eventually turning more negative, then turn it off, go outside, take a walk, meditate, whatever that, whatever that looks like to, to feel more connected to yourself and, and um, kind of bring you back to, to reality. But I think the, the main point of, of social media is, is all positive. Great. Thanks, Noel. I think we have time for about one more question. Um, so this question, I think it's a pretty good one of, you know, tell me about your creative process. How do you create content? How, you do, how do you think through kind of some of those, those posts that you're, you're wanting to make? And so I'd love to hear from, you know, some of you about kind of what that process looks like in deciding what you, what you want to post. Um, 
Neil, do you want to maybe maybe start us off? And you know, you had your your video series on on LinkedIn, so I'd love to know like how you kind of went about starting the thought process of what you wanted to even talk about. Sure, um, it's funny. My my ideation process actually comes. So I'm uh, I like to do go on long runs. Pretty much every single content piece that I've had is probably on a run um, because I think that w one thing that I do when I'm running is I kind of reflect on my own experiences and I reflect on you know what am, what, what am I hearing? What what am I going through? And you know, I start, I start to formulate. Okay, what, how could this kind of turn into content? Um, so, uh, so I think that w w any audience member that's maybe listening to this, maybe um, as as, I know, as you're kind of going through school or as you're going through work, take the time to you know just be like, you know, what did I learn at work today, or what did I learned at school today, and you know, just kind of reflect on that, and then you know, and maybe make a post about it. Or sometimes I know another strategy that a lot of people use is they'll maybe set a, time, uh, set a couple hours off on a weekend and to just kind of think of ideas and then write, write those posts out. And then they already have their post for the entire week, like maybe two or three posts and uh, they're good to go. And they kind of have this, this ideation cycle every, every week. I know uh, uh, some other people like to use tools as well. Uh, there's a very popular tool called Notion, which is kind of essentially like a content calendar. Some people, some people like to leverage that. And the summary that I'm trying to say is that everyone has their own ideation style. Um, but I think that, that what it comes true to is that, uh, that most people leverage it based off of their experiences or what they've seen uh, kind of going on uh, with friends. So that, that, and that, that's kind of my ideation, ideation process and how I see other people kind of reflecting on it as well. Cool. Thanks. I love that. And yeah, I think some of the best things ever happen on runs and some of the best ideas come from that. So I, I feel that. Right. Uh, Taylor, do you want to share with us some of, you know, the inspiration behind kind of how you, you and your sister work through what those, what those posts are? Yeah, well, you know, there's definitely two sides of it. Like, say, for instance, if a brand is, like, you know, paying her to create content, usually, like, um, those brands, they already tell us specifically what they're looking for, um, so we don't really have to come up with much, you know, because they, they, they really pick it out um, to the T of, I want it to be just a headshot, I want the lighting to be like this, so, you know, I think that isn't too creative um but when it comes to like <laughs> when it comes to other type of posts like her just wanting to post something on her own um we try to do things as or naturally as possible um the thing is since she's 13 years old and you know just keeping her personal brand in mind people still want to see like her personality and maybe we can show that personality through the colors that she wear um I don't know. I just think with us, it's just more like natural and not like overthinking it. Maybe we can overthink it a little in the caption so you can kind of reel people in that way. Um, but yeah, I just feel like it's just not to overthink it too much. Yeah, I think most of us don't have brands to adhere to in other companies <laughs> that we're adhering to. So I, but at the same time, I, I appreciate you, you sharing those thoughts and I think authenticity is huge. Uh, Robbie or Noel, do you have do you have thoughts to add of kind of your your creative side, Robbie? Yeah, I'll just be real quick. I I if you're you know, and photography is a huge part of what we do, um, as I'm sure it is with Taylor. Um, and I'm sorry, Neil, but I'm not going on any runs. It's not for me. I don't do it. I I'm not. -uh. Um, but so I I really like to you know look for scenes and just throughout your daily life when you're looking at pictures. Um, it's really trying to put a lens to, you know, we, we are looking around every day and what would look really cool in a still shot. And I believe that, you know, each and every one of us has really cool scenes around us. And if you want to make a go a really cool scene, there's something within a mile of you that can be outstanding content. And I think that's part of the beauty of social media is there's something great around all of us that we can share with people thousands of miles away. I love that, Robbie. I love it. Noel, I know you obviously don't, you talked about, you haven't focused a lot on your building your own brand, but I wasn't sure if you had thoughts to add as well of your own creative process. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the clients and the advertisers that I work with at Snap, I am a part of the creative process to an extent. Usually when they come to Snap, they are creating marketing campaigns to either build brand awareness, drive purchases, drive app installs. So my take is usually giving them best practices on what will eventually drive a user to take that action that they're hoping to achieve. So because Snapchat is a vertical format, we make sure that they have the creative assets to do that. 
whether that be ver whether that be vertical videos or vertical images or gifs or um, whatever that looks like um, also something else that we usually like to kind of have a conversation about is leveraging the different kind of formats on snap there's the snap ads that will usually fall within user stories or the discover feed um, or there's the fun lenses that all brands kind of want to tackle and, and be a part of there. But um, usually the, the purpose is really um, for Snap Ads specifically, because that's kind of our bread and butter product, is how can we express an or how can we how can we express the messaging within the first two to three seconds of the of the image before the user swipes over to the next user story. The purpose is to swipe up so we can get them to their landing page to drive more traffic and to eventually get more sales for them. So um, that conversation usually looks a little bit different for all because of the different objectives. Um, but I think the point is to have a very clear, concise, singular message and to always have a call to action. So you're bringing that consumer more simply through to um, through that purchase funnel um, to get them to take the action that you're wanting to, them to do. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I think it's, it's great to kind of hear your version and kind of on the more consumer um, producer side of things. And so I um, really, really appreciate you for sharing and all of you for sharing your, your experiences and, and your, um, your journeys with us. And um, I'm really happy to have had you all join us. We are a little over, but I'm gonna quickly wrap up for everyone. Um, First of all, again, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our, our panelists for joining us. Um, it's really great to see um, Highlanders off doing great things all over and, and connecting in a lot of different um, areas. If we had a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to, so you know, I encourage folks to potentially connect with these folks on, on social media. You know, they're all obviously on, on social, and so um, yeah, keep asking those questions that I know a lot of you um, had that maybe we weren't able to get to. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, speaking of following, um, also follow the Alumni Association. You know, we have lots of different events like this that we have going on throughout the year. And so follow the Alumni Association, follow the Orange County chapter. If you are in the Orange County area, follow them on, on Facebook. We've got Facebook, Alumni Association has, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn um, page as well. And so um, beyond that though, we also have the Orange County chapter email there. If you do have questions for, for Ann or any of the, the folks down there at the Orange County chapter, um, there's their email for, for you to connect with them if you have questions at all. And then similarly, we have a, a number of other events similar to this, a couple other panels and whatnot coming up. And so we have our Highlander Welcome with the Black Alumni chapter that will be coming up in a few weeks here. And that'll be focusing on giving back as an alumni, the three T's, so time, talent, and treasure. And so this one will be focused more on, on the alumni experience and how to give back to, to current students at UCR and to the UCR community. We have our Industry Insights series, which focuses on specific industries within within um, the world. And so we have one on, on entrepreneurship on September 1st. That'll be um, with a couple of different recent graduates who have um, gone on to do some pretty great things with, with some startups. We have a UC-wide alumni event um, focusing on career negotiations. And so that'll look at salary negotiations and other types of negotiations in the career field. That one is at 12 p.m. The rest of these are at 6 p.m. Um, then one more industry insights focusing on careers in sports. So we'll hear from some um, UCR alum that are in um, sports positions, marketing for sports, all those different kind of roles within, within the, the realm of sports. Again, all these will be in, begin at 6 p.m. And then there's also the link to our career services website um, for all of our alumni that you know may need um, a little assistance and um, resumes or whatnot. We've got some great guides and resources on there as well. So definitely encourage you to check that out if you have any, um, any need to, to you know, see what we are offering you as, as the Alumni Association. Um, but really are um, so happy to have had our, our four panelists join us today. Thank you again for, for joining us. And uh, like I said before, this video will be emailed out to everyone so you can um, share it or, um, or view it later um, after the fact. So thanks to all of our panelists and have a great night. Thanks, have a good night.